this afternoon on behalf of the Institute for Advanced Study. Um, as most of you are aware, the Institute for Advanced Study has for a long time played a very important role on campus in encouraging and facilitating faculty research and creative activity. We do this in a number of different ways. We invite people to give a named lectureship, to interact with people um, in the course of staying here for a week or so. We have begun to have a series of inter and transdisciplinary seminars um, that range from such, topic, from such topics as energy, to life writing, to translation. But perhaps the most important program that the Institute for Advanced Study has had is to bring visiting fellows here for a period of two or three weeks to consult and to collaborate with other faculty. And it is, of course, that particular um, program uh, which is, has brought us here this afternoon. There is only one real obligation on the part of our visiting fellows, and that is to give a public lecture so that their expertise and their knowledge can be shared with the wider university community. So I'd like to turn things over now to my colleague, Maria Couture, who will introduce this afternoon's <coughs> Um, I am particularly pleased to introduce today's guest, uh, who I was um, able to uh, bring here with uh, help from a lot of colleagues, some of them present here. Um, I should uh, now also say that uh, Professor Miroli's visit um, is also helped facilitated uh, with support from the Russian European Institute and the Center for Global um, and, uh, Studies as well. Uh, Professor Mihaila Miroyu um, has a very impressive um, curriculum vitae that would be summarized uh, in many words. Uh, I will just say a few things about her. Uh, she's currently the Dean of the Political Science Faculty at the School for Public Administration. Um, and she's also the founder and director of the Master's in Gender Studies program. And I should say that this is uh, the first MA program in Gender Studies in Romania. And I hear that she has helped um, develop one, um, the second one that will be opening soon in Cluj as well. So uh, she's uh, very active in this field, as you can see. Uh, her particular field of research is political theory, um, ethics, and feminist philosophy, and these are the topics that she has written a great deal on. She has, to her credit, two books on feminist philosophy, a uh, book on Romanian conservatism, uh, conservatism in Romania after 1989, the neoconservatism, um, a book on Romania on applied political analyses, and a book on professional ethics. So you can see she's got a breadth of uh, different topics that she covers with her research, and also her teaching, I should add, and teaching all these fields as well. Um, she is also the founder of the first feminist NGO after 1989 in Romania <coughs> called ANA, the Society for Feminist Analysis, which now also has a publication to its name. It's, it's periodic that comes out three, two, three times a year, something like that. Four times a year at this point. And she has written, she really truly is a uh, public intellectual as well. She has written many, many articles uh, that I think you could take probably a, a volume itself to list uh, in various uh, periodicals uh, in Romania that deal with all the issues that have already come up, uh, specifically gender issues, higher education, and civil society. Uh, today she will be speaking about uh, the uneasy way of autonomy, the perverse effects of transition for women in Romania, which will combine some of the topics that are listed of interest to her. Please help me welcome Professor Miroy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation to all the institutions involved in this kind of uh, things here in Indiana University. Uh, I feel lucky to be here with you. Uh, and I think the, I felt all the time that all of you are colleagues, irrespective to the age 
or ethnic group. And I discovered here the most friendly Romanian community <laughs> I saw uh, abroad, or sometimes even in Romania. <laughs> uh, and thank you very much to all of you. I have to apologize for my English because I practiced English just reading books. Uh, I had very rare occasion to speak in English. What I will present now, the uneasy way through autonomy, the perverse effects of transition for women in Romania, is not at all a philosophical issue, uh, because I am more accommodated with the philosophical and political uh, theory. Uh, and it is the result of some research we've done in the last years. One is, I have just a Romanian uh, form, women and men in Romania. These are statistical data. And the other one, it's fortunately in English for uh, all of you who are interested in having a larger view on this issue. Gender barometer, this is a poll on opinions applied in August 2000. The content of my presentation is like that, an atypical context, the development of the modern patriarchy, the economic and social sources, and the cultural and political sources, and of course, conclusions. Modern feminism has been basically shaped in the Western countries of Europe and North America at the same time with the industrialization process. Due to the separation between public and the private, between the productive work and the reproductive one, the traditional patriarchy was replaced or adapted within the modern patriarchy by which women have become dependent on men as income and status. Industrialization created a large number of housewives. In other words, the dependence of women on men concern not only the traditional cultural aspects or the juridical and political ones, but also their economic survival and their social identity. Despite the formal equality accomplished by the first wave of feminism, most of women did not reach a real autonomy as a consequence of their dependence on men for income and status. On this ground, the Western European countries and North American countries, as well as Australia and New Zealand, entered the so-called second wave feminism, which aimed at the transition to a gender partnership, firstly, by the cultural recognition and, and acceptance of the differences between women and men, but secondly, by emphasizing women's self-esteem through self-assertion and autonomy. Only <clears throat> under these circumstances, it was possible the transition to the third wave of feminism which retain all the second wave agenda concerning the groups usually ignored by the unilateral perspective of the white middle class women in Western countries. Romania has an atypical background. The beginnings of the feminism of equality originate in the first half of 19th century, but Romania did not pursue the same process of industrialization as the Western Europe. Economy was mainly based on agriculture, organized around traditional rural communities. Women held an important role in these economic activities. The embryonic industrialization did not significantly affect society, so that one could not speak of a real divorce between domestic work, productive work, or between public and the private. Population was mostly formed of peasants, and it was significantly marked by a traditional patriarchy. The proportion of housewives was very small, and by consequence, the economic condition was not strictly 
related to men. The establishment of communism after 47 has differently directed the gender relations and it involved a massive and compulsory industrialization as well as a huge migration of rural population to urban areas. The Romanian Communist Party, the state party, proclaimed the equality in rights and duties between women and men. It enforced the constitutional provision that all income should consist of either salary or pension. Each citizen, no matter of sex, has the duty to work if she or he is in the capacity to do it. Since these stipulations were also valid for women, the state took over the problem of children's raising and by consequence has created and supported a large number of nurseries and kindergarten mostly located nearby industrial plants. Almost half of the workforce was represented by women. Education was gender blind and it aimed at producing the new man, a person strictly devoted to the state interests with no masculine or feminine qualities. Formally, and to a great extent real, the mature and elderly women were neither economically nor as status dependent on men. The number of housewives was not significant, under 3%. Communism has preserved instead a fatherless patriarchy, namely the traditional patriarchy in the family consisting in, in men's symbolic role and in women's double day. As a result, communism in, includes a mixture of egalitarianism and traditional patriarchy. Women held leading position through a quota system. They depended few or at all on men, but they depended on state, which acted as an absolute patriarchy. The classic patriarchy was mixed with the state patriarchy. This affected women more than men because of the state control over women's reproductive capacities and the lack of resources which made women overburdened in all kinds of daily living strategies. It is important, in my opinion, to point out that the patriarchal state has negatively feminized the Romanian men too. They were deprived of autonomy, of a real participation in the public life, and finally, of the control over their personal life. The experiences of these people who lived for a long time in a totalitarian system, it is also my case because I had 35 when uh, it came the revolution, are similar to those of women who were released from a patriarchal system. So, what women have won in communism, namely jobs, economic and status independence from men, assistance in children's raising, promotion in leadership position, was not the result of the feminist struggle or politics. What Romania has lost was the second wave of feminism, entirely impossible in such a totalitarian context in which autonomy, at the individual level and self-respect were suppressed by the focus on collective interests. As a result, in 89, our society was confronted with three aspects from this point of view. The traditional patriarchy, gender egalitarianism, and state patriarchy. It is important to note that the communist politics brought to women certain benefits, economic and status in de independence from men, support for bringing up children, and even women's promotion in leading and management positions. However, it is also important to note that men and women's dependency on state. If autonomy means self-government, then it was absent as experience for both genders. We shall see below how, from a gender perspective, the fall of communism was accompanied 
accompanied by the rejection of, of egalitarianism as state policy, it was consistent with the maintenance of the traditional patriarchy and the raising of the modern patriarchy. Consequently, the transition produced women's dependence on men. I stress on the first aspects of the modern patriarchy, which comes with the fall of egalitarianism. After a decade of transition, we reach polarization, a web of hierarchies, and the shaping of status, wealth, and or income elites representing less than 10% of the population. These elites monopolize the power, have economic, symbolic, and or social capital. They dominate all the public life, politics, professions, high positions, and civic influence. The former egalitarianism has fallen. But this fall was not accompanied by a coherent equal opportunities politics policies. The prevailing policies consisted rather in protective measure for the groups that lost income, position, or status. As a result, the hyperstratified patriarchal model set up at the level of the entire society and facilitated gender discrimination. Today, men's chances to highly managing position are double, and as far as the access to financial resources is concerned, women have 2% chances, while men have 8%. Young women have a higher education than young men, but men tend to dominate the business. It is interesting to note that this is a quite present phenomenon in many other societies, where the gender balance is much more elevated. One of the main factors contributing to the polarization and hyperstratification of our society is the absence of the middle class. The scarce resources are, in fact, directed to the members of the elite. Add to this the fact that over 70% of the population lives in a relative or absolute poverty in equal proportions. This should be not surprising once we consider the distribution and the level of the income. In Romania, only 1% of the total income comes from profit, 5% from liberal profession, 33 of salaries, in average of $100 a month. Retirement benefits, $70 a month and 25% from unemployment benefits and occasional activities. I think that one of the main problems with the attempts to understand the condition of women in today's Romania was their focus on the members of the elite. Usually, we did not conduct special research concerned with the huge rest of the population. However, my view is that we can learn more about, our, uh, about society and about Romanian women once we concentrate upon the majority of the population, the 90 people who are not members of the elite. And this was the case of the research uh, I mentioned above. As I have already mentioned, women's economic dependence on men is a new phenomenon which appeared in the context of transition and replaced the former interdependence. Moreover, this dependence to be identified, especially in the group of young women, tends to establish the modern patriarchy. Also, unwillingly explicit, the source of this dependence lies in the policies designed and implemented by the Romanian governments in the post-11 years. It was not an intention. It was a byproduct. A significant characteristic of the policy process was the important role of the demands and pressures of the trade unions from the male-dominated industries these governments have all along sustained, irrespective to their uh, right-wing or left-wing uh, appartenance. The state ceased to be protective for women, but instead 
remained protective for men who turned into the favorite children or better sons of transition, at least in terms of the income gained from the redistribution of the public budget. The post-communist transition is characterized by the distribution of power in men benefits and by the redistribution of the social costs prevalent in women's detriment, even though apparently these costs seem to affect more men by the dramatic decrease of the industries where they are working for. The first paradox of the Romanian transition is that men's earnings become much higher as compared to those of women, 53% higher. Although the unemployment is mostly masculine, 52%, and the unemployment along, uh, among women tends to diminish 12% according to the most recent statistics. One of five women has no income, four times more than men. And poor women gain much lower than the threshold of poverty. Taking into account all the categories over that income, the weight is between 26 19, while in the superior category of incomes, the weight of women is only 2%. Transition meant a dramatic decrease of the industrial production and the increase of unemployment, migration from urban to rural, from industry to agriculture. The consumption from GNP is 30% lower for women. This means also that a considerable part of women's consumption depends on men income. The industrial branches in which men are dominated, or they are dominant, even if many of them as mining and metallurgy are actually bankrupted, are state subsidized and their employees enjoy wage increase. Their, un their unemployment was supported by so-called compensatory payments. One can easily remark that women work in withstanding fields, textile industry, public services, trade, public health, and education. In some of these domains, employees do not benefit from wage increase due to the fact that productivity is not very high which is not also the case in male industries, and the state does not support them, which is not the case in the male-dominated industry. On the other hand, in the budgetary sectors like health, administration, and education, salaries are low. The mature and elderly women have been strongly affected by the influence of the ideology of gender egalitarianism and they passed also through the experience of depending on state, but not to that of depending on men for their economic condition. Now, as far as the Romanian young women under 35 are concerned, their socialization contained gender egalitarian elements. However, as a matter of fact, they become more and more dependent economically and the status on men. Indeed, two-thirds of the young women do not either have any income or they gain less than $40 monthly, while 47% of young men gain over this income. The average of unemployment or uh, of unemployed women is 20% percent, while that of the women from the young generation is nearly 40. My point is that at that moment, the inequality between women and men turns into dependence of women on men. The government did not seem to realize the deep, deep significance of the present social trends and continues to comfortably design policies which address women 
who have no jobs simply by including them in the category of housewives. In the same time, men's problems are addressed differently. Indeed, according to the present day policies, men who have no jobs are included in the category of unemployed. The underlying idea seems to be that housewives perform this role by free choice. Consequently, their problems are not public, but private. On the contrary, men's being unemployed is strongly regarded as a political problem, a major political problem. Besides these general discriminations relating to the income, there are two categories of women who stand for absolute poverty. The elderly women, 80% of the total numbers of widows, and the single mothers, 96% of the single parents. An essential error that encourages a dramatic increase of the gender discrimination is the fact that in Romania, were not implemented public policies for women. These policies would have led to empowerment. Instead, there were implemented only social protective policies, supported by poor resources. Women look to be more significant for government as victims rather than equal competitors with men. One of the most important paradoxes is women's empowerment through education. Women's social progress is superior to men only if we are taking education into account. Perversely enough, their advantage turns into a serious obstacle in their attempt to entire in the labor market. Traditionally, Women had a lower education than men, but this tradition evolved much. Focusing on the last decade, observe that in 98, the number of women enrolled in academic programs was 250% as compared with 90. Now they represent 53% of the graduates. Women's progress in the 90s was not in debt to any intentional or specific policy, but to the fact that the prevailing masculine education, especially the technical one, went into a major decline after the collapse of communism, together with the industry which had absorbed its graduates from 62% in 90 to 27% of the total number of graduates. Women are practically directed towards education, but ironically, after graduation, much more than men, they have less room into the working place. In the Romanian context, it is not higher education that brings high incomes, but the occupational status. The members of a new generation of high school graduate women look to be the best candidates for housewives. High schools start to mimic the interwar housekeeping schools that had as main function to delivery of young women on the marriage market, except the fact that the education for the private life lacks completely. As compared to women, men engage themselves more easily to the labor market because they graduate vocational schools, notably. What happens then with educated women? They start to practice unqualified labors, especially on the black market. 40% of women would go on depending on their parents or men, husband or concubine, or on more men. This is a case of the women who are forced to pro prostitute themselves, mostly of them single mothers. In Romania, one hears from time to time discussions on the legal status of prostitution. 
and they are plenty and a lot of intellect, influential intellectuals. On my view, legal provisions to disincriminate prostitution would mean at the moment another source of the tendency to eliminate women from the competition in the ordinary labor market. The consequence would be that this other group of people, besides housewives, would be regarded as subject of a non-political process. Which are the cultural and political basis of women's dependence? In the post-communist period, modernization in an egalitarian pattern broke down with without being replaced with a strongly ideological and political offer similar to those of liberal democracy, uh, read uh, Western democracies. As a result, the actual image is one of the cocktail of pressures and influence. And I try to elicit some of them. A, the increase of the conservative right-wing influence through the church the right-wing parties, and through the public discourse of many intellectuals of the elite. B, the liberal parties and the social democrats one do not have a proper agenda concerning the gender relations. Women are rather treated politically as candidates for protect protective policies and not for public policies that encourage capacity building. C, the poverty and the tendency towards ruralization written the foundation of a social modern modernization and represents a step back, even with respect to the communist egalitarianism, an egalitarianism of poverty in its term. The left-wing conservatism, collectivist, and statist is coherent with the excessive masculinization of trade unions and it pressures a specific pattern of GNP, on, of GNP's redistribution, which is most favorable for men. Women tend more than men to disappear in silence when there is no more need of their work. Men are strong, strongly protesting. E, the tendency of media, notably TV channels, to overtake a post-feminist approach as a consequence of a spontaneous globalization. The artificial, independent, and successful Barbie doll type with sex appeal, career, and access to a high standard of consumption makes harder the grasp of a feminist discourse. The same thing happens with most of the magazines dedicated to women. In the same time, women's media image is that of either victims or del delinquents or prostitutes. Practically speaking, the average women, they are not interesting for, at all for media. F, the tendency of the normative legal modernization, equal opportunities, comes especially under an international pressure, European Union, United Nations, the Convention for the Elimination of the Discrimination Against Women, and Beijing Plus Five, which are really very influential in our environment. And finally, the development of a local feminist movement is produced mainly in the academic environment and in the NGOs focused on research and education, shyly getting closer to the grassroots. A new feminist network was created, although unfortunately it did not have yet much political influence. As a matter of fact, we benefit from an improvement of the knowledge of the gender relations in Romania and we could even recall that we are going to reach a critical mass in analogy with the creation of now in United States. Some words about the patriarchy in the private sphere. The poll, this one, the gender barometer, reflects the existing culture and it extends 
the chance of uh, grassroots feminism. The private sphere can be described as follows. Women stand entirely for breadwinners, managers of the home resources, providers of housekeeping services, babysitters, teachers, then all the care work plus job. Men have preeminently the role of breadwinners. This attitude is perceived as natural and normal, put it into commas, by two thirds of the subjects, no matter of gender. They believe that it is women's duty to do all this, women's natural duty to do all these things. The average of men's involvement in the domestic activities is of three quarters of hour a day, a day, while women is of four hours. This varied involvement is also due to a certain division of work in the family. Men are absorbed in cleaning car and maintaining the car. Women are absorbed in feeding, cleaning, taking care, and bringing up children. How is this phenomena justified? Tradition is the main answer, but a post-egalitarian one is also provided. Man's role is justified given that he is the main breadwinner. 46 of men declare that they earn, earn more than women. 13 say that women earn more than men. That it is the counterpart of the fact that a great part of women's consumption, consumption depends on men. The cultural pressure, the return of tradition, and even more, the recently sociocultural pressure push men to take charge of the financial responsibilities and women towards the responsibility of taking care. But the sad thing is that when it comes about practice, men opt for the former responsibility while women are left with both. The contemporary status of a married mother was built on the image of all in one of the multiple responsibilities. Even if a woman raises her children with a partner, in the everyday life, she remains a single mother who also takes care of the father of her children and of her old, uh, old relatives. This kind of work is recognized as difficult by 81% of the subjects. The symbolic patriarchy is very coherent. The lack of gender partnership in the private sphere affects women's participation and involvement in the public life, especially in business and politics. Although most people believe that women are capable of both activities and that their presence in business and politics could play an important role. When the subjects are asked why they think that women's presence in business and politics is very low, the invoked arguments are the double working day, 68%, the fact that men avoid women as competitors. Men are very aware of, of that. Uh, their answer is 65% in uh, the favor of this explanation, but just 49% of women are aware of it. And the fact that women have been thought that leading is not their business, 48%. Leadership is identified with male, first of all, in the family. 83% consider that man is the head of the family. Only 8% reject this idea stating that the gender doesn't matter. Men are conceived as the head of the household by 67 of the subject percents. I'll not repeat these percents. Okay. And 32 state that women have this role. However, only 20 percents of men consider that women are the head of the household, while 80 percents of women agree with it. Taking into account this discrepancy and the fact that the financial decision concerning the everyday expenses are mainly female, 45 of women and 14 of men, 
take uh, the decision. The balance increased for women, especially in the most traditional regions. We can easily notice that we are invaded by a prevailing symbolic patriarchy. According to this kind of patriarchy, <clears throat> there is even an hypocrisy in admitting the existence of violence in their own family. 18% of women declare that they have been beaten by their partners, and 1% of men declare the same thing, while 53% of the subjects agree that they know direct cases of domestic violence against women, and 17% of domestic violence against men. Likewise, the more traditional the region is, the more increased the cases of beaten men are. The situation must be explained as a violent revolt against a supremacy which has no other foundation than the tradition. This kind of patriarchy reproduces itself at the public level. The position with the overloaded symbolic authority are men's monopoly. The domains with the highest shares of women's rejection are the parish councils, 77%, and the presidency, 73%. Women's acceptance as potential presidents or as members of the parish council does not surprise 2 3%, no matter of subject gender. It seemed that the evolution towards a gender neutral approach and softly towards partnership acceptance referred to either the local administration or to the democratic institution as local councils and the parliament. However, let us not forget that what we are talking about here it's only a matter of principle and not the current practices. The actual percentage of female mayors and members of local councils, as well as the, in the parliament, is not higher than 3 to 7 percent. We can see in the polls that many subjects, 61 percent, are gender neutral concerning the possibility that women can be elected in such bodies. However, these gender neutral preferences are not direct, the di direct result of the transition ideology, but rather of an inherited egalitarian routine. Significantly enough, only two to four of the subjects consider that women are better suited than men to get such position while 32 to 36 of the subjects consider that men are better for such position. The only majority choice for women is represented by the schooling parents council, a choice which is coherent with the idea that women have better abilities for care and education. More than half of the subjects admit that in reality, Women do not have equal rights with men. The egalitarian neutral pattern had no longer a post-communist support and could not have any more. This pattern is, however, detectable, especially at the mature and elderly townspeople. However, the idea of a gender partnership is most common with the young people from cities, especially the students. But as soon as this category enters the work market, the principle of this partnership falls in favor of another reality. Few resources, small job offers, and in, the, in, in this context, the ex-colleagues and partners become competitors. Half of them tend to be taken out from the competition by the excuse of tradition, women's role is that of taking care of children and of home, by anti-communist excuses, the time when we were equal and the time of women's forced promotion passed, by post-feminist excuse of the superwoman 
If you want to be a successful career woman, mother, mistress, or wife, in the same time, you should be beautiful, sexy, well qualified, and especially a star. Some conclusions. The egalitarian communist strategy was directed towards the development of the unique working people. Through social homogenization, the discrepancies of gender, race, ethnicity, culture, and income have been elevated, destroyed, or just hidden. The post-communist discourse about alterity has started to gain a larger ground by the mixture at the political and cultural level of the pre-modern traditionalism with the modern dualistic tendencies and with the post-modernist and multiculturalist tendencies. The last ones have emphasized more the ethnical problems and less the gender discrimination. The prevalent policies designed and implemented in this period led to men's dependence on the state redistribution policies and to women's dependence on men. Second, the origin of the modern patriarchy in Romania is not similar to that in Western Europe. The foundation of the modern patriarchy have been recently created as a byproduct of transition. Third, the sense of the evolution is not directed from the traditional patriarchy to the modern patriarchy and partnership, but from the traditional patriarchy through communist egalitarianism to modern patriarchy. Fourth, the locus of patriarchy is different. In the Western societies, patriarchy is drawing back from the pub we hope so, from the public life, economy, and from the official culture, and then from the private life. In Romania, women seem to lose ground on the work market. The main discrimination refers to occupations and income, and they were induced by the new Romanian capitalism. As a result, women's marginalization and their exclusion from the public sphere and from the access to income lead to a completely new phenomenon. Women depend on men. They gradually pass into the category of housewives in the urban area, respectively of unpaid family worker, workers in the rural area. And the last conclusion, all along with the accession process of the European Union, we can estimate a shift of policy focused from social protective policy to public policy centered, centered on development. We do not know yet how this politics would affect women and gender relations. In order that the effects of these policies be more balanced than those of the spontaneous transition and the spontaneous globalization, the social phenomena should be politically governed. Women's organizations should leave behind their shy attitudes and evolve themselves in policy process at the level of trade unions, political parties, local administration, and government. There is an obvious progress in recent years in women's gender awareness regarding business, media, and politics, that means in the elite. However, this progress did not lead yet to a critical mass, a mass represented by a political and militant feminism. I think that it is only very recently that we can speak of an alarming point regarding the hardcore of gender discrimination. Women's problems and feminist agenda can be no longer perceived as an important merchandise or as a cultural exotism, but as a sharp internal necessity and a political issue. Thank you very much for that.